Well, what a morning, right? You know, as we get up this morning after yesterday and the last few days being in the 40s and, you know, uh, almost 50s, uh, we are now in the 20s you know, with snow blowing around in case you're watching this later. And uh, with the promise of uh, single digits in the next couple of days, you know, in the evening. So I told you, don't get fooled that uh, winter is done. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't think uh, it, our snow was done even. So as we look to March, you know, if you lived around here long enough, you know that uh, these are the day, the times that we get fooled, you know, thinking that spring is upon us. And it is not, not yet. So um, um, hopefully you're, you're just going to have a great day today. Hopefully you've had an encouraging weekend. I know it was uh, challenging for some as we walk through, you know, what, what does God's word have to say, you know, about standing up in a bowed down world. And uh, so we're on week two, week three of this week. So we should be praying, you know, for that uh, today. And so with that being said, let's jump in to a very uh, well-known passage of scripture, but one that can always bring warning and, uh, and challenge for all of us. And that is the story of David and Bathsheba. If you're new with us, you know, again, I would encourage you, you know, for everybody to just to click uh, like uh, if you're on uh, Facebook and if you're on YouTube, click subscribe. This is what they tell me to tell you about once a week, you know, to be able to do um, so that this is going to be something that's encouraging as we continue to move forward. So very famous passage, uh, and we are going through the book of 2 Samuel, and we happen to find ourselves in chapter 11 on this day. So if you got your Bibles, open them up, you know, with me. We are in 2 Samuel again, 11 verse 1. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war. So um, that sets the stage for everything. We know that in the previous chapter that uh, David was out there in war, and because David was out there doing what kings should do in that day, God granted success. But here is a situation in a season. Now, most wars uh, would take breaks uh, when it came to some of the winter uh, you know, seasons. And so they would, uh, as soon as spring started, they would just go back to the wars in which they were fighting. And so uh, in the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, so that sets the stage, like I said, for everything. David does not go out to war. Instead, he sends his general, his, you know, the commander of his forces, and he stays back. That's it. That's the decision that led to his downfall. Who, who, who would have thought that something small, you know, would lead to something large? Now we're about to talk about, you know, how uh, this is an ongoing issue for David. But uh, the first and foremost thing is that when we're called to do something and we don't do it, there are usually are consequences. Consequences because God is calling us to do things that are going to help us in relationship with Him help us in relationship with other people or bring glory to God, even though it may not help us at all. And so um, um, most of those things God holds us to and we choose not to do those things. Uh, there's a product of the consequences in which we might face. And so in the spring of that year, when kings normally go to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So that sets the stage for what we're about to read. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So let's back up. Um, it says, you know, in the afternoon. So uh, he has a rest. He's getting older. He's resting in the afternoon. He gets up and he walks about. And as he peers over, he sees this woman who is naked and who is bathing. And uh, he notices instantly how beautiful she is. And he begins to lust after her. Now, again, looking at something, something that comes across your eyes, something that comes across your face, that is not where the sin starts. You know, there's many things that come at you, you know, and, and things that surprise you, but it's the lingering, it's the ongoing. Now, remember, one of David's downfalls is going to be the downfall of his son, and that is women. God called, you know, all his people to have one man, one wife, and David choose to have multiple wives. And here's what we learn, you know, from David, you know, as well as from uh, uh, his, his, his son, you know, uh, Solomon is going to have 700 wives and 300 concubines, is that lust does not end with the amount of women you have in your life. 
That's the thing that you gotta understand is that you think, well, if, if I only can get this, then that lust or that craving, almost like a hunger, is going to subside. And yet what you know is, even if you fulfill that craving, that desire, it actually comes back stronger and it, it can actually lead to death. And so understand that this is what David walks into. Now, now is Bathsheba, you know, uh, completely innocent in this? We don't know. I've read a different couple, you know, commentaries, you know, on about what's going to happen and, you know, um, um, the, where she is bathing and the time of day that she is bathing. They usually do it in the morning at nighttime when you can't be seen. So is she doing it out in the open? Who knows? You know, but regardless of what she did or whatever, you know, people might say how complicit she was in this, David still has to own his own actions and not just even what he saw, but what he did on what he saw. So it has nothing to do with Bathsheba in terms of what he did after he saw. Then David sent messengers. Oh, by the way, then it says, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So here's what's crazy is David is told immediately that, it, first of all, who is Eliam? Eliam, you know, um, was one of David's mighty men. You know, that we find, you can read about him in 2 Samuel chapter 23. His grandfather was uh, Athipophel, I think is how you say his name, who was one of David's chief counselors. And then you've got Uriah, who's also one of David's mighty men. So you've got three generations of people who've been loyal to God and loyal to King David. And he's going to betray them all based on an act of his flesh. And then we see that this, then David sent messengers to get her. When she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed purification rites after having her menstrual period. So what the reason that's mentioned in there is because there's evidence and proof again that this is the right time for her to actually have a child, to actually become pregnant. And there's nobody else, so you can't blame it on anybody else, you know, for this act taking place. And then it says, then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent a message to David saying, I'm pregnant. So David's like, uh-oh, I've satisfied my lust, you know, and I think I'm going to get away with it. But then I find out that this woman is pregnant. So now what am I going to do? I've got to try to figure this out. And, you know, again, the, the worst thing that we can do when it comes to um, sin coming to the doorstep or coming out is for us to bring it to the light. As soon as we keep it in, as long as we keep it in darkness, it has power. As soon as we expose it to light, it loses its power. Yes, is it painful? Yes, is it hurtful for something to come out to confess, you know, a sin or something that you've done to somebody else? But in the long run, it's way less painful than trying to keep it in the dark because you lose the joy internally and all the cover up and the lies can lead also to further destruction and disaster in your life or in the lives of other people, which we're about to find out. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, oh, sorry, then it says this, uh, then David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Then he told Uriah, go home, relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he left the palace. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guards. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. So here we have Uriah who's acting honorably, trying to honor his men when even before him, he's like, man, it should be nice to get a little break, go spend time with the wife, you know, have some meal and be able to re refresh and relax and then be able to go back to my men. But that's not what he does. He says, basically, if my men are sleeping on the ground, if my men are hurting, I'm going to enjoy them, even if I have the opportunity to actually find some relief. Uriah replied, the ark and the armies of Israel Oh, so, so and then he says, well, stay here today, David said, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited him to dinner and he got him drunk. Okay, so this is spinning out of control, obviously, because he's thinking maybe if I reduce some of his inhibitions, he'll actually do something that I actually want him to do. But again, the slept, but, the, but he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. 
So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and he gave it to Uriah to deliver. So, you know, number one, here's the sin. Number two, I try to cover it up by bringing the husband home. That doesn't work. So now I'm getting more desperate. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. Can you believe that? That the cover up that David wants is so desperate that he's willing to kill one of the people who stood behind him when he was in the caves, who followed him when he was running from Saul, who was there this entire time. And that, my friends, is what sin does to us. It breaks relationship with God, with ourselves, and with other people. And it's so easy to fall into that trap. I know I've fallen into that trap and hurt other people and lost relationships because of pride or because of other things in my own life. And so it says, and when the enemy soldiers came out, so then Joab signed Uriah, did these things. When the enemy soldiers came out to the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. Then Joab sent a battle report, which would often take place, you know, to David. He told his messenger, report all the news of the battle of the king, but he might get angry. And he asked, why did the troops get so close to the city? Didn't they know they would be shooting from the walls? Wasn't Abimelech, son of Gideon, killed at Thesbez by a woman who threw a millstone down on him from the wall? Why would you get so close to the wall? Then tell him Uriah the Hittite was killed also. So obviously in that kind of war, you don't want to get that close to the wall because they can throw things on you uh, like a millstone. You know, they can shoot arrows at you. And so you try to keep your distance from a military strategic standpoint. So the messenger went to Jerusalem and gave a complete report to David. The enemy came out against us in the open fields, he said. And as we chased them back to the city gate, the archers on the wall shot arrows at us. Some of the king's men were killed. And then he mentions, including Uriah the Hittite. Well, tell Joab not to be discouraged, he said. The sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow. Fight harder next time and conquer the city. So when Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. And so, What's interesting here is you see this as it ends, is that it looks like on the outside that David has done something of honor, uh, that, hey, here is one of my mighty men who's died. I will then take the mantle to take care of his wife and his family and continue the legacy on. And yet it is just the final piece of the cover-up, or so he thinks. Tomorrow, we get to look at you know the prophet Nathan who comes and he gets a chance to rebuke David. But as we close today, my prayer for you and my prayer for me. Is there something crouching at the door? The door of your heart, the door of your mind. Is there something that there's sin that's in the dark that needs to be exposed? Is there something that if not dealt with, if not brought to the light, if not confessed to God and to other people, because God knows, but sometimes you got to go to other people that you know exactly where this is going to lead. It's going to lead to destruction. And so my prayer for you and me is on this Monday, and it's hard that we would confess first and foremost to God and that he would give us the courage to confess to anyone else that we might need to confess to, to bring restoration and healing so that you and I would not fall into further destruction. All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much. This is your day, and we give this day to you, and we pray that your spirit will bring to heart and mind uh, areas of sin in our lives. Uh, maybe it's it started and right now it's innocent. Maybe it's a an emotional connection that potentially could lead to a physical one with somebody who's not our spouse. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's arrogance. Maybe it's thieves. Maybe, we're, maybe we've stolen something. Maybe we've lied. Father, I don't know, but I pray that you would just bring something to the surface and that your spirit would guide us as we continue to deepen ourselves in our relationship with you and our relationship with other people. Thank you for bringing things to the light and for using these kinds of scriptures to remind us of who you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Have a wonderful day. Please, please stay warm. It's going to get cold these next you know, uh, few uh, days for sure. Uh, love you guys, and I'll see you guys again tomorrow.